you serve in Afghanistan and then do you go, I mean, back to the States for a bit and then to Iraq or directly to Iraq from mm -hmm. Afghanistan? No, I came home for a little bit or did some recovery, checked yeah. in with my beautiful wife to make sure she was happy. Yeah. Um, look, they had uh, the Louisiana National Guard was looking for some volunteers and to help beef up their forces that yeah. were going to, have to Iraq right. because they were short. Yeah. So at that time in 2005, uh, I joined the Louisiana National Guard. Louisiana. I mean, you just spent a year in a war zone, so why would you want to go back and spend another year in a different war zone? It kind of helped me finish my time out, mm. you know, active duty. Yeah. Plus, I felt it was kind of my, they were looking for people, and as a military mindset like I have, I yeah. said, yeah, I'll go help you guys out. Sure. Now this is, if I remember, is this this is the surge, right? 2005, 2007 area. Right. 2003 um, was the big fights, yeah. the big wars, the big battles for Ramadan, Fallujah, right. down in uh, the Baghdad area. Yeah. In 2005, when I got there, it was just kind of quieting down just a little bit, but then right in about the middle of 2005 we had a big influx of insurgents pop back up and start really wrecking havoc. Yeah, and so that's when the number of troops going to Iraq really uh, really grows. What was your job in Iraq? I was assigned to the uh, Alpha Company 1st and 156 CAV unit as a infantryman uh, patrol sergeant. I was a uh, E7 at that time so I was in charge of the patrol going out. Once they found out that I was certified as a sniper and through the Army shooting team, uh, they pulled me aside and said, we need you to conduct some sniper operations, at which time I traded my M16 in for an M14. And I would go out with patrols, and while they were out doing uh, searches and stuff like that, I would sit up and watch and look for uh, counter sniper operations. You'd be up, you'd go up to a high building or something? High buildings, overwatch areas. Yeah. Uh, several times I was sent out during the night time. We were getting IEDs placed in some intersections just outside the base. So I would go in with my team, which was two other personnel, my spotter and a radio man and my security, and sit up in a building and overwatch those intersections and see if we can catch them doing that. Uh, in a typical mission like that, how long would you be in place? Usually just until about dusk. We would go in okay. at, at dusk, just before it got dark, uh, go in, set up, and stay there until uh, daylight, just before daylight would pop up. Wow. Uh, we would ask for an extraction so they couldn't see where we were coming from, and we would go out. And get there at night, night then? Wow. Uh, we had one operation where we had a uh, individual the day, a couple days prior, was placing an IED in an intersection just outside of the south part of uh, Camp Striker. And we had a team set up in a building, and they watched this guy come back and forth in a white vehicle. Uh, he got out a couple times. He would kick the rocks on the road. He would look around, see what he can see. Uh, he came back the third time, and he got out of the vehicle and walked up to the building where this team was sitting in, which was, we still get a laugh about it. Mm -hmm. He'd walk around the building outside, and he looked in the window one at, on his third pass. Uh, two guys were sitting along the window on both sides, and when he looked in, they snatched him up, drug him into the building. The look on his face, they say, was outstanding. Mm. Um, they secured him, and the team went out and checked his vehicle, and sure enough, he had IED components he was fixing to put in the road that day. Wow. So you were a sniper, um, and, you know, roughly just guessing how many, how many times did you go out? I went about five times. You were... Um, Awarded a Purple Heart. From I was your, a recipient of a Purple Heart, yes. Recipient of a Purple yes. Heart, that's right, yeah. What's the distinction? Because before we started talking, you. An award you made that is something that you did for recipient. achievement. Yeah. Uh, like uh, weapons qualification, uh, uh, excellence in job performance, and stuff like that. A recipient is when it's like the Medal of Honor. The yeah. Medal of Honor is not an award, it, you don't get that. You're a recipient for what you've done. Uh, Purple Heart, you are a recipient for being wounded in action. Right. 
Which isn't something you set out to do. No, you don't. Something that, that happens just, to you. It's like we said, you forgot to duck. Yeah. Uh, we were out on patrol. We were going from Camp Striker over to the Green Zone, which is a major MS uh, military supply route yeah. between the Green Zone and the camp that we were stationed at. Uh, we would go down to the Fort Cloverleaf, which is the main area for the mall that Saddam Hussein had set up. Yeah. We would make our turn around and we would come back. We did that uh, several times that day and we set up at a, uh, a big t uh, radio tower where it was a secure area. We'd go in there, take a break, have lunch, eat our MREs and stuff, yeah. and then we would go back to Camp Striker in the same direction. Uh, the, about the fifth time we were going back towards Striker, somebody had laid boxes in the middle of the road. Uh, mm. We had stopped our patrol, we cleared those boxes to make sure there weren't any IADs in them. At that time, it appears that the uh, insurgents had uh, delayed us enough to where they can pull a taxi cab up on the road once we went back towards the green zone and pack it full of explosives. Uh, we're not sure pack what. Pack the taxi? It was a taxi. Yeah. It was, I can still recall it was orange and white. Mm. I was in the uh, passenger seat in the front with my driver. My gunner was up in the turret. I had a medic in the back seat with me. And as we approached the taxi cab, my gunner didn't say anything. The two vehicles in front of us didn't say anything. And when I got broadsided with the vehicle, he detonated. It was a remote control detonation. Wow. Uh, either by cell phone or a, a switch. And at that time, uh, I mean, our vehicle rocked. It was a fireball, a big explosion. Uh, I was basically knocked unconscious. My gunner was screaming because he got hurt. Mm. Uh, my medic behind me, he was completely knocked out. My driver was able to maintain control of the vehicle and move it a couple feet forward and stopped. Wow. Uh, the next thing I remember is somebody yanking our doors open and my gunner yelling, he's on fire, and he dropped down in the, from the gunner's, gunner's position and he ripped off his body armor and stuff and he was bleeding. So he was bleeding all over us because he took a hit in the back of the head and I don't recall anything after that other than I jumped up in the gunner's seat and pulled security. Our platoon leader came back and said, get this vehicle back to base. So it was still operational? It was barely operational. Barely we had flat tires. Wow. At that time, I didn't realize that we had a ruptured fuel tank. We had enough fuel to get back to base. Wow. Um, now, so you... Are you, you must be kind of in a state of shock or something like that when you go up and take the gun. I was more or less, it was my training that yeah, kicked in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. And I just jumped up there, yanked the, the 50 cal back around, yeah. and started scanning the area. But there's no firefight that ensued. It was Nobody's like engaging us. It was yeah. uh, just, they just wanted to destroy a vehicle. And I was the third one, and that was usually. In a patrol, your platoon leader is in the third vehicle, so that way you can control yeah. the firefight if you get in one. Your platoon sergeant's either in the first vehicle or behind the platoon leader, so they were primarily targeting the leadership, which would have been the t platoon leader. But my platoon leader, which was a great guy, always liked to be out front leading, and that's why I got the hit. I see, okay. Because they were, they were expecting he'd be in the, yeah. the third vehicle. So your vehicle gets back on base, and so just walk us through the, the process. The medics come out, what, what happened? We uh, pulled in the base, we pulled up to the, our platoon leader and the lead vehicle got in the gate. As I pulled my vehicle up, or had my driver pull my vehicle up, a guard jumped out in front of us and said, hey, you got flat tires, you got flat tires. And I was, at that time, I had calmed down, but I was mad. I mm. was severely mad because before you go in the gate, you have to clear your gun, uh, your crew gun. So my gun was still loaded and locked and loaded. I yelled him, get them out of the freaking way. I have a wounded man on board, and the expression on his face was like, 
oh shit. <laughs> he opened the gate and he, we rushed in. We went right to the uh, aid station in the yeah. hospital. Uh, they yanked my gunner out and they took him in. I looked at my vehicle and I was looking around and I was starting to, my adrenaline was starting to drop a little bit. Yeah. The platoon leader asked me if I was all right, and I said, I'm fine, I'm fine. Just get my gunner in there and get him taken care of. Uh, when I went into the hospital tent uh, where we was at, they were removing a piece of shrapnel out of the back of his head that he took from the, uh, from the explosion. It wasn't until later on that I realized I got a piece of shrapnel in the back of my head because the helmet strap was applying pressure to my wound and it sealed it off because I keep my helmet pretty tight. But when I got blown up, my helmet went forward, a piece of shrapnel hit me in the back of the head. Wow. So when I got home, the doctor realized that I had shrapnel. But before that, because of my injuries, and I was knocked unconscious, incoherent, I was recipient of Purple Heart then. So Yeah. You gonna made it okay? Uh, I have what they call traumatic brain injury from that, yeah. loss of hearing in the left ear uh, and post-traumatic stress because I can, I sometimes I recall this incident and I start doubting myself. Maybe I should have stayed up in the gun turret. I would have probably saw the taxi cab. My gunner would not have got hurt. But that wouldn't be your job. That wouldn't be what you would do. It wouldn't, but I always yeah. like to lead from the front, like my platoon leader. Yeah. If my troops are out there, I want to be out there. If my mm -hmm. troops are in the gun turret in the sun, watching and pulling security, that's what I would do. Yeah. How does the, what, what impact has the traumatic brain injury had? I mean, how does it show up, or does it show up in sort of everyday it, life? It does. Um, memory, recall, uh, a little bit of frustration sometimes. Uh, if I don't do something like I used to be able to do uh, proficiently and effectively, it frustrates me. Mm -hmm. My wife notices that uh, my recall or I lose track of thought. Mm -hmm. um, did your wife know about this soon after it happened? She did uh, three times. Three times? Uh, the first time uh, the hospital called her, uh, second time I called her, and then she got another call and she thought that I went back out and got hit again or wounded again. Oh. And that's when uh, I talked to her and she says, you need to retire, you need to get out. How long had you been in at that point? At that time, uh, 28 years. Wow. Almost 30 years. Yeah. And I had, uh, prior to me going out, I had just put my paperwork in for E8 uh, because they were looking at me, I was probably would have gotten promoted to E8 yeah. And one step grade higher and either became a master sergeant or a first sergeant. How long was it? Um, you know, you hear stories like a World War II guy I talked to. He got shot down, uh, I think over Peleliu, went into the water. They picked him up. He was on a, another plane the next day. Um, how about in your case? How much, how much downtime did you get before you went back out? Uh, 24 hours because my vehicle was gone. Uh, yeah. The flat tires, the ruptured fuel tank, uh, the, the uh, cargo hatch was completely blown off yeah. and just hanging by one strap. My 50 cal box took a big chunk of metal from the vehicle in the taxi. Uh, luckily our 50 cal was still operational but the box and some of the ammunition was damaged. Mm. Uh, my medic was still were trying to recover and my gunner well he couldn't go back out because of the wound he had mm. but uh, in fact I gave you a picture of what it looked like out there because when we got pulled in uh, the EOD went out there and took a picture of the site because they had to figure out what type of explosive they used on us or what yeah. kind of ammunition or munitions they used yeah and they brought back a picture and they said this is what's left of your taxi cab it was just the rear axle and the front axle. The rest of it was completely gone. Wow. There was bits and pieces laying all over the highway. How would you compare um, the experiences in Iraq and, and Afghanistan? I mean, they're very different societies, right? Same, same general war on terrorism, but very different. I and mean, how would you compare those two efforts? The uh, Taliban 
um, in Afghanistan basically hid and attacked at night because that's their their mode of operation. Yeah. They're familiar with the terrain, they're familiar with, they've been fighting this war since 78, 77 with Russia. When the Soviets came, yeah. So they had basically had a good feel of the terrain, the country. Um, Afghanistan is hilly, a lot of caves, a lot of place to hide. Uh, their yeah. villages are really packed tight, close together. Uh, when we would go into a village, I mean, our, our vehicle would go down a street you were basically you would couldn't even open the door on your vehicle because you were right up against the houses. Yeah. Um, yeah. They had the advantage on most of the hills uh, where they can see down into us, and we couldn't see up onto them unless we had predator or eyes in the sky. In uh, Iraq, it's more open. The cities are more like a city. So, and your people. Uh, basically would talk to you, communicate with you, because we went into Iraq and we got rid of a dictator there that was basically raking the money in. The people were being substituted or segregated. You had the Shiites and you had the Sunnis events fighting against each other. Uh, he been in power for decades. So if you look at his palaces, some of the stuff he had in his palace, and you wonder why he did not put that money to use uh, with his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you, um, so let me ask this question first. When you left Iraq, and you, you were there a little bit over a year, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you left Iraq after that tour, and how, at, at what point in your tour did did the ID incident take place, like near the beginning, near the end, halfway through? It was through? Uh, in July, uh, about midway. About midway through. Mm -hmm. what, what impact did that have on you? Did that change how you did anything, or did that change your thinking about things? Or? It didn't change my thinking about things. Uh, it became more, uh, more aware of uh, teaching my patrol when we go out to really start watching for this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that vehicle suddenly appearing on a road and it's yeah. real low on the axles, uh, that was a telltale sign uh, sure. that somebody, something was not right because when we went down that route, we never allowed vehicles on the road or parked on the side of the road. And all of a sudden, here's a vehicle that's parked on the side of the road. So reinforcing that with my platoon and yeah. my squad and my patrols, you yeah. know, watch for this stuff. I, I mean, I've heard they would even put IDs in dead dogs and yes. under trash piles and all this. And there's a lot of trash. There. Yeah, there was. In fact, we found several of those. Um, and you would go down the road and all of a sudden you see a trash pile and you're walking that route instead of driving it because you would, you've you got uh, railroad tracks, you've got trash piles. You don't want to take your vehicle down there without somebody being in front on foot and a patrol watching for wires and stuff that doesn't look natural because uh, in a vehicle you wouldn't see it for one thing and by the time you did see it it's too late yeah. and we found several of those along the railroad tracks uh, that would go down the main one of the stride streets yeah and we would call the EOD and the EOD would bring out Robbie the robot we'd back off pull security in the area they would send the robot down there with a camera slowly uncover it, yeah, that's an IED, that's a 105 round. They pull the robot back and attach a uh, bomb to it. They would lead it out on the cable, just like you would see in the hurt locker. Yeah, yeah. And pull the robot back and detonate it and blow it up. Mm. Um, Do you think that movie captures some of the stuff in Iraq pretty well? Some of it, but some of it, it's, it's theatrics. Yeah. A lot of it is, but some of the stuff the EOD did, yeah. But yeah. The, the drinking, the partying, him leaving the compound and going out and finding the kid. That's not going to happen. That, that don't happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When you left Iraq, I asked this kind of question with Afghanistan too. When you left Iraq, did you feel confident that this was a country that, you know, could get it together and actually be functioning? I believe that country could get it together a lot faster than probably Afghanistan, yes. Yeah. 
It's a more modern country, right? More modern. Uh, yeah. A lot of the military that we got rid of there, uh, the leadership, uh, was gone. It either was killed in combat or they just they just disappeared. And the people that we were putting in place was, uh, or helped putting in place, was taking more control of the town. Yeah. Uh, you can see that when ISIS tried to take over mm. Iraq after we kind of pulled back. That there was some credible resistance. Yeah, there was some credible resistance. Plus, they yeah. had control of some of their oil fields, and that was one of the breaking incomes. And they yeah. didn't want to leave that and give it up. So. Yeah. So, I mean, after a long, you know, nearly three, three decades of service with the military, um, what would you say is the, you know, I don't know, the most important lesson you learned? What's the biggest takeaway? You know, I mean, what's the, is, is there a certain thing? I mean, you, you saw so much in so many different countries, so many different experiences. Is there something, you know, just a, a sentence or two, that you, you know, this is kind of the, the big thing I learned from this whole process? That uh, there's a lot of countries out there that do like us, do appreciate us for what we do. Yeah. We're the only country that a lot of them come to and say, help me. Uh, and we, we send our people there to do it. Well, Mr. Stats, I really appreciate you, uh, you taking the time to, uh, to talk with us. It's, um, it's a pretty amazing and varied career. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.